All right. So I'm Kirk Anderson from the Carl Hayden Bee Research Center here in Tucson, Arizona. And I'm going to talk to you today about honeybee microbial ecology. Um, first, I want to uh, give a big shout out to my lab. There's some old lab members here and some new ones. Uh, Dwan Copeland has been working, this guy right here, been working uh, day and night to produce a whole bunch of good stuff, some of which I'm going to share with you today. And this is my technician, Brendan, who's been with me for about 20 years. He's like my radar O'Reilly, kind of, for those of you who used to watch MASH, old enough to remember MASH. So one of the most interesting things to me about honeybees is they've, they've been called a holobiont. And this theory about the holobiont, I don't know how many of you saw this movie, uh, the movie where everything in the world was connected. Avatar, that's what they called that movie. So this is kind of the holobiont theory that everything is connected and everything is evolving together. So the key component of, of the holobiont theory is that the things evolve as a collective, that the host and the microbiome uh, evolve together. This might be largely true of, of what's going on with some of the gut microbes, especially in honeybees, but uh, um, for the social microbiota, which I'm going to talk about a lot, uh, the microbes that are found throughout the hive environment and food stores that are associated with social nutrient processing, um, the holobiont theory kind of up in the air for that. Here are two of my favorite books. Uh, one's a human superorganism, which kind of outlines the, the connectedness of the human. If you want to read a really good layman's version, of uh, the effect of the microbiome on human health and disease, this is this would be a good start. It's a fairly old book now, but it's really good. And then the superorganism. So I, I got I got a, the opportunity to actually work with Bert Holdobler uh, in Germany for quite some time. And both these people, EO's gone now, but these were some really really fantastic individuals. And this is this is one of my favorite books about social insects. And really, if there is a holobiont, it, it is probably the honeybee. So I feel very lucky to have been able to work on, on honeybee colonies. So some of my uh, lab agenda here, the long-term goals are understanding the rare biosphere and the pathosphere. And this association with colony level processes, dysbiotic states that occur in guts and different disease states. So that's I've been heavily, in fact, we defined, my lab defined the social microbiome, which are these protective microbes shared across the nutrient processing niches. So the social microbiome, uh, it's easy to think about. These are the aerobic and, and micro aerophilic uh, microbes. They're associated with nutrient stores. And the hindgut microbiome is largely anaerobic and aerotolerant. It's highly predictable. Actually, both of them are highly predictable in terms of taxonomic memory and not so much structure for the social microbiome. But here, <clears throat> here at the USDA, they make us produce a, uh, a five-year plan, which is always hilarious. It's one of those want to make God laugh jokes, you know, make a five-year plan. And, and here was my five-year plan for this five years. So it's pretty general, trying to understand the microbiome in terms of health and disease. So a lot of the focus, and especially Nancy Moran's lab, uh, who have done an incredible job detailing the gut microbiome, and she's produced a couple of uh, veritable progenies in, in Hao Zhang, who's now back in China, producing his own fantastic work. And uh, Philip Engel, who's in Switzerland and uh, Lausanne, the fundamental the fundamental school there, and he's he's doing some really outstanding work too. Like uh, Nancy's is tapering out of the honeybee world, but uh, this the the incredible proficiency of these two and three labs has kind of pushed me into other things because I certainly cannot compete with those three people uh, doing what they do. So my my involvement uh, involves uh, is is more about queens and larvae and kind of the interaction of the whole colony. So you can see a general kind of general hypothesis up here that bacteria commonly shared among tissues developmental states and casts, like reproductive casts, are cryptic drivers of disease evolution. And we're beginning to see a lot of uh, evidence that, that that hypothesis is true. 
And I'm not going to read all of that there. So for tonight, I'm going to talk about how we define the social microbiota. And I did a, a, some work with Marla Spivak on the effects of propolis on the social microbiome. And then some of the larval disease diagnoses that, that we've been doing in Illinois, which is some interesting stuff. And then the probiotic antibiotic experiment that I recently did with uh, Randy Oliver. And if we have time, the microbiome of queen quality, really one of the hottest hypotheses that we have going now in this lab is this queen quality hypothesis. And it's, a, I think it's strongly tied to the microbiome and the early microbiome. So in general, the microbiome represents a, a huge ecosystem or an ecosystem of some size and ecosystems can be complicated or they can be relatively simple. So uh, like on this, the step of out in Caldwell, one of the places I lived there, uh, it's a desert, largely a desert ecosystem. There's ants and then there's some small rodents that prey on those ants and seeds. And then there's some there's some raptors there that eat those rodents. And really that's the extent of that ecosystem. Wow, we're having a monsoon here. At any rate, the ecosystem can involve all of these different types of interactions. So it turns out to be a myriad of ways that you can characterize an ecosystem and all the interactions within an ecosystem. Now here's a you know, simple way to think about a macrobiome. And so it's good, I think, to start with macrobiomes and to, to move your brain towards the microbiome. So here they got annual precipitation and average temperature. These deserts and up here are tropical rainforest. We get a lot of both. You end up with a tropical rainforest. Um, so this is a good, good place to start trying to define, hey, what's the niche space of a lot of these plants and animals that are living in these, in these areas? So the honeybee ecology is a little... Uh, it's not more complicated, but it's very different. So one of the, I think two of the major things controlling uh, what goes on in a hive, oxygen exposure and water availability. Right? So we've sequenced, now we've sequenced everything. This is my primary tool is to next generation sequence of basically everything in the hive over and over and over in different states. And that's the data set that I, that I act from. So in reality, the the is the niche space and the ecology is multi-dimensional. So this is this is a goal, really. This is a little kind of pictorial model or a cartoon of of one of the goals of the lab is to understand the effects of various things and and how they influence uh, different tissues and different little systems within the hive uh, to either you know proliferate different types of bacteria or what. So uh, niche is dynamic and influenced by uh, multiple parameters. So the Martha Gilliam, who was here and did some incredible work uh, early on, I'm now in Martha Gilliam's old lab, you know, Diana Samatoro's old office, uh, but she, she worked with the tools that were available to her at the time and she did a great job. So basically what she had were these enzyme characteristics. So she would get a microbe, she would isolate it, and then she would she would define the enzyme characteristics that that microbe had. So she didn't enumerate, hey, how many of these microbes are there? And there wasn't a very good taxonomic system at the time. So she couldn't, you know, put it into a big database and say, you know, which microbes are there? Are you guys finding these microbes in Arkansas or, you know, in China or whatever with, with bees across the world? Uh, she didn't have that ability. So what she did, she had 6,000 microbes that she found, which was, uh, was fascinating, but virtually nothing on how abundant microbes were in different environments or really uh, finally defining taxonomically what those microbes were. So those have been two of the things that, uh, that I've been doing. My primary research is high throughput sequencing and bioinformatics where we, we sample a tissue or a niche, we find these bacteria, and then we, we can confirm the taxonomy quite well with, with the uh, databases that we have now, and then we can analyze the microbiome. So this is, this is one way of analyzing a microbiome where you have a group that totals to 100%, and then 
Wow. And then some, some percent, this tells you the percentage of each microbe that you have in that particular, in that particular gut or that particular niche. And then you could compare it to other things. So this works because all of the bacteria have the same, not the same 16-H gene, but a homologous 16-H gene, which means it performs the same function, but there are chunks of that 16-H gene that are variable. And it doesn't matter if those particular chunks vary. So it doesn't affect the function of the ribosome. So if you affect the function of the ribosome, you basically have a dead organism. So this, these, they vary in these uh, in certain places. And so you through that variation, you can determine what particular species that you have. And then we have now this B exact classifier, which was just created by Brendan Daisley, who's also doing, you know, the work that these next generation kids are doing who grew up playing on these machines, right? So he's uh, he's really he's really been great for bee science. So the, the classifier we have now is extremely accurate as the name be exact might suggest. And so the, the microbes that we're getting are easily comparable across studies and across regions and across environments. And so it's very, it's been a very uh, prosperous time for honeybee microbiome, microbiome research in general, but certainly for, for honeybee research. So in quantifying this ecosystem, as I said, you end up with this total amount of microbes from whatever tissue you're looking at or from whatever niche that you've decided to study. And one of the big, one of the big defining characteristics of a healthy microbiome or a healthy ecosystem for that matter is evenness, that you have a number of species that are interacting as a group in this ecosystem. So uh, clearly then dysbiosis is, is dominance, which would mean for this bar over here, it would just be all one color. So here's the, the honeybee, and I keep putting this up here so you recognize that this is a microbiome that I'm talking about, and the different colors represent different species. And you have an even, kind of an even distribution of these species. So we've quantified all the bacteria that you find on the mouth, in the crop, which is a social organ. The mouth is clearly part of a social organ for this organism, right? And the midgut can, be, can have up to a, a billion bacteria in it, which is uh, odd, but that's during dysbiosis. Uh, the ileum is packed with microbes as a biofilm. And the hindgut, in fact, well, most of the bacteria are in the anterior hindgut here around the rectal pads. Uh, but that is also generally an order of magnitude more than the ileum. The ileum is generally an order of magnitude more than the midgut. So the point is, if you sequence the whole gut, really what you're going to see is the effect of the rectum. It's going to drown out most of us. You see a little effect of this generally, unless it's a dysbiotic gut. Uh, but that's what you see mostly are these two niches, as indicated by the shading. So early on, Martinson, who was here at the University of Arizona and worked with uh, Nancy Moran, uh, did some of these uh, fluorescence in, in situ hybridization. It's a cool technique, and basically you put a molecule in there that can light up a different color. And it will attach to, it can attach to specific taxonomy within the bacteria. And so it can report to you when you fluoresce it, it reports to you back a different color. So these are some of the main or the three main bacteria in the ileum, which is shown here and here. And that's this, this little teeny bit of stuff right there. And it folds up like this. So when you pull, you pull it tight, it has these little folds in it. This constriction that it goes through. So this shows you where the Snodgrass cella is, the lactobacillus and the gilliamella in this, uh, in this gut. And here in the rectum, we have a big a biofilm. So this is a little chunk of the rectum. You can't see the full, um, the full extent of the, the populations in the rectum. Now, Randy made this for me in 2015, and it shows, hey, not only are there not only are there bacteria in the gut, but there's plenty of bacteria here in, in, in the larva, 
and things that may or may not come from nectar. So we're not really sure, but we have really got a good handle on that. Now, what are the things that are coming from the environment versus the things that go with the swarm when they leave and then repopulate the hive? So I was not necessarily expecting that, but it turns out that that's a very real thing. So the gut microbiota has, has co-evolved with diet. So the, the in the workers, when the workers consume uh, massive amounts of pollen to become nurse bees, um, these are the species that, that will populate the worker very early in its life, getting in there by three days. Uh, most of these are already in there. So we're, we're uh, busy classifying the early succession of workers. And we've done that for queens as well. So now we have a big, group of queens that, so we understand basically the succession that occurs and so this you have to know what this is so you can see anything that may be out of the ordinary you have to create a baseline of, of what of what is normal so the social microbiota which i've been mentioning uh, evolved with nutrient processing so similar to the gut microbiota evolving with the diet that's going through it nutrient processing for instance bubbling being in the crop, moving back and forth, everything that the bee is doing is, is extensive water control, very extensive water control, especially here in Tucson where it gets really hot. They, they go, they spend, I would say, 90% of their time trying to control water here uh, during real hot times. And this affects uh, the microbes in the hive environment. Here I've listed you know, bee bread, honey, and larva, and, and sources that come from outside which is uh, pollen, nectar, water, and resins. So all of these have an effect on the social microbiota. The social microbiota affects what is in the gut as well. So all of these, the hyperpharyngeal gland has its own microbiome. So it can be up to 10 to the fifth uh, bacteria in the gland. It's a big open gland with, and, and the bacteria just climb up there like they do uh, with the uh, urethra for lack of a better example. So here's, Here's an example of the, uh, the niche ecology. And what this shows you is the crop, which is the social stomach of the bee. And these are the food, the corbicular pollen and the bee bread. The bee bread's about 50% honey by weight, according to work Sue Nicholson did. And our work agrees with that. Um, so you see a, a very a kind of a sieve, a sieving effect is what this is, where when it enters the crop, there's a horrible killing chamber, basically. So you end up with this lactobacillus and these acetobacteriaceae that seem to survive the crop. Um, so that's a, th these are two of the, um, the social microbiome members. So the bee has these elaborate mechanisms to control my, microbial growth, which are uh, probably quite well known to people who have studied bees um, in terms of making hydrogen peroxide and turning the solution acidic. And, and the honey is just overwhelmingly hygroscopic, which means uh, it, it, it sucks up water when it gets a chance. But Generally, there's not enough water and honey for anything to survive. So most microbes go into stasis if, if they're in honey. So at the, the interface of honey, and the same is true of bee bread, at the interface with oxygen, you, you have a lot of hydrogen peroxide being produced uh, through, this, through this reaction, which relies on having oxygen. So this, this really only happens at the interface with honey. So that bubbling uh, gives you this interface uh, with oxygen where this reaction can take place where the glucose oxidase can actually uh, have its have its way. The royal jelly is also a unique and interesting antimicrobial environment that we've done a lot of work on now too. So it produces, so secreted into royal jelly are antimicrobial proteins and antioxidants. It contains lots of antioxidants and uh, glucose oxidase, as we talked about, and even a superoxide dismutase is uh, secreted into royal jelly. And so a lot of the social microbiome have learned to, have evolved to survive, bacteria aren't very good at learning, but they have evolved to survive 
in these substances. So we found two of these major members uh, early on. This is from work that a postdoc in my lab did, uh, Voivoditch, and back in 2013. And so we looked at uh, species of Lactobacillus conchii, which is now called Api, Apo Lactobacillus conchii, whether these things survive, could survive in uh, concentrated honey and whether they could survive in uh, concentrated royal jelly. And both of these, if they had been sampled from the honey beehive, uh, they survived well uh, in, in the hive uh, environments. But if they had been sampled from plants, they did not. They were greatly inhibited. So this is an inhibition assay where you, you put discs into, into a growth medium and you see how well the bacteria grow in response to whatever, uh, whatever substance you want to put in here. So it turned out that both of these are likely evolved as hive specialists. Um, then we discovered when we started looking at these queen guts, that both of these species are prevalent in the guts of the queen, which is really interesting. I can't see it, but you can see uh, both of those over here, the Parasacrobacter, which is, its name has been changed to Bombella apis, and then the Lactobacillus conchii. So these are the two. That. So then we decided we do a meta-analysis of since I got this fantastic guy, uh, Dwan Copeland here uh, to do this kind of stuff, he did, we did a meta-analysis of the bacteria in the guts of workers and queens. So, and we classified it with B exact, which is the best tool that we have now. And so it got data from 27 recent studies uh, that were uh, Illumina sequencing, not 454, which is now defunct. And uh, 3,043 total libraries. So these are from across the world many different places in the world, and total 159 million sequence reads. And so this is a big pile of data, but you can see down here uh, where, I can't see my cursor on this. You can see down here where the, um, the queens are, have a very different microbiome than the workers do. And, and what's more, it looks like, hey, some of this worker microbiome is shared with queens. So that's a, what we what's what we're referring to as the social microbiota. These two, and there's perhaps a third species, which is Fructobacillus fructosus, which we uh, we don't have in abundance here for whatever reason. Um, but these two species uh, readily populate the food stores, as such as the bee bread and the honey. And workers prefer to consume uh, species that have recently bloomed with these two species here at uh, 24 to 48 hours. And this also populate queen mouth parts and mid guts, as I had suggested, and they populate royal jelly and the worker mouth parts and the hyperpharyngeal glands and the larval guts. So this, this is a social microbiota. It contains many other species that are less abundant than Bombella and Apilactobacillus, but these are the two prominent species uh, that comprise the social microbiota. So uh, one of our big pushes here that now is to understand how does the pathosphere uh, interact with the social microbiome. So this leads into the, some of the work that we did on propolis, because propolis seems to have uh, this, effects throughout the hive. Uh, they found in one study that there was some effect on the gut microbiome, but we, uh, we've we rerun that study uh, in spades and we didn't find much effect on the gut microbiome uh, based on the study we did, uh, but we found a lot of effects on the social microbiome. So basically we, we ran you know, three colonies of each, uh, some were lined with propolis. So we put this you know, the broken inside of the box, they they rough it up and then the bees fill it up with propolis. So you'll have colonies that are filled up with propolis, colonies that aren't. And we sampled nine day old nurse mouth parts from those and did 16 per colony. So it was a pretty good uh, sample size to assess the microbiome. 
So we found out the social microbiome is greatly enhanced by propolis addition. So it reduced the prevalence and abundance of opportunists. So this is with, with, with propolis here. So much less bacterial diversity in general. And it enhanced the growth of the bacterial microbiome. So you had a lot more of species, but those three species were the Bombella apis and the Apolactulus conchia and the Fructobacillus fructosus. So those, those are our social microbiome species. So I was awarded a grant uh, a little while back to work with Jay Evans and Megan Milbreth uh, looking at brood disease. So this is another place where the social microbiome um, uh, is probably having uh, some effects. And so what we're, we're just here are our objectives here and we're, we're slogging our way through this, but I was awarded a postdoc to do this as well. So I came up with an idea that, well, we could, we could take pictures of all these larval phenotypes and then we could correspond those pictures with this with the microbiotic characters. And then we could produce a predictive algorithm where you, you could take a phone, you could take a picture with your phone of the disease states and then potentially diagnose uh, early brood disease uh, based on a, on a photograph. So somebody bought that somewhere and so they gave us money to do that. So we've been high throughput sequencing these different brood disease states. So we're, we're you know, trying to recapitulate our, our results in vitro, which uh, are in, is very difficult to rear larvae in vitro. Um, fortunately, uh, Duan is quite good at it. Um, and so then we're getting bacterial isolates, isolates that come from these disease states to try to characterize the pathosphere and look at the pathosphere's relationship to the social microbiome. So here's, uh, what the heck am I doing here? So first we, I guess first we had to characterize the microbial succession in the absence of disease. So apparently if you got disease in an apiary, like we were talking about earlier, then uh, typically the disease is, is spread amongst most of the colonies and you can have elevated levels, even though you don't show uh, symptoms of say EFB disease, you can have elevated levels of EFB in your colony. So what we did is we looked at, uh, we looked at some larva and from an apiary that had no history of, of brood disease. And uh, here's what we found that a variety of bacteria occur in early instar larva. And a lot of these have been associated with brood disease in the past. So here's Melissococcus is the black one. And it shows up, this is first, second, third, fourth, and fifth instars. And we see a lot of the bacteria that are known to be associated uh, with European foul brood disease. That's what's caused by Lysococcus platonis, for those who didn't know. Enterococcus is sus suspected to be a secondary invader, as is uh, Panibacillus albi. So we saw a lot of these things occurring in, which may indicate what we're working on now is this, is this an indication of immune training, that a lot of these pathogens occur at small numbers, because these aren't very big microbiomes. So this is 10 to the fourth down here, and they get up to 10 to the fifth. Uh, and these are number of cells of microbes that are in there by the time they get to fifth N star. So mostly is dominated by Bombella, which is our uh, social microbiome member, and Apilactobacillus, the yellow one, also a social microbiome member. Um, so pretty interesting result that we see all of these different, this variable number of bacteria types in early larva might be immune training. But we're gonna see if that's true. So then, with this knowledge, we decided to do a case study of diseased apiaries in Illinois. So we have a number of apiaries that we're analyzing, and I'll show a few of them to you right now. So we photographed and sampled EFB and EFB-like disease across many of these. And here's a weird little example of one that looks melted, which is um, apparently gives beekeepers a lot of problem, but often doesn't come back 
uh, from, so Beltsville does some of these characterizations. And these, these melted larvae often don't come back with any information, um, just basically are left undiagnosed. So our design was, uh, oops, our design was to capture uh, some disease progression. So within an apiary, we sampled a healthy hive, which just means one with no evidence of symptomology, right? Um, so the larvae look all plump and round and they're in the right C shape and they're floating in some royal jelly and so on. So they don't have any sign of disease. So we sampled third, fourth, fifth instars from healthy frames. And then from the diseased hive, we sampled healthy frames and larva, third, fourth, and fifth instars. And then from a disease frame, we looked at what we called incipient symptomology, which are third, fourth, and fifth instars. And then the advanced uh, symptomology, which are mostly unidentifiable, like this one over here. I'm not really sure what at what stage that one became deflated or stopped developing. So this is just advanced disease. So the, the slides I'm about to show you are all based on this sampling design and this inferred uh, disease progression here. So unlike the first slide, these are notoriously uh, uh, complicated slides. I have to apologize for that. Uh, so third, these are third, fourth, and fifth instars, third, fourth, and fifth. And this is based on our design where this is an asymptomatic healthy hive. And you hear you see something, you know, see a little bit of these, but mostly the, the social microbiome there. You see some, uh, some interlopers here, which are the Enterococcus faecalis, the black against the Melissococcus. So this is an asymptomatic. These are asymptomatic uh, larvae in diseased hives, and they contain lots of EFB, which you might expect. They just haven't, they haven't produced any visual signs yet of being sick. And then of course our symptomatic individuals. So the interesting thing about this data is we ended up characterizing a number of different states that really aren't well known about European fowl brood. So most of our stuff has been, uh, most of the data thus far has uh, made inference based on culturing. Um, so we got very uh, different results. This is next generation sequencing and, and uh, very different results. So we got fructobacillus fructosis, which is, is, looks like here that it's participating in the end stages of, of death here, uh, along with a few other uh, secondary invaders. Now, something might be considered a secondary invader, I guess, if it was happening here uh, when they're still asymptomatic in a diseased hive. So these might be suspects of things uh, that would be secondary invaders. And, and over here you have, you're going to have some really dead larvae. So these are, you know, ooh, you can't fault a bacteria for eating something that's dead, right? So it may not, it may not have anything to do with, uh, with the, the progression of disease. It's there uh, mopping up the dead stuff. So they call those saprophytes, right? So this is a saprophytic activity largely in this area. So we, I'm showing you four that are all very different in terms of the way uh, the pattern, uh, the pattern of disease progression, uh, disease progresses. And this is another one. We end up with lots of lactobacillus conchii in the final mix here. It started out with lots of lactobacillus. Um, here we have, uh, these bacteria that are part of the worker ileum that are showing up and dining on larva and look like they're probably secondary invaders. This is Frischilla ferrara. And here we have some in the healthy individuals. Um, can you guys see my cursor moving? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> When I say here, I'm going to follow my cursor here. So this one also ended up with a lot of fructobacillus in the uh, in the the dead larva. Da, we found something that wasn't EFB at all. So we ran all these, and we're like, "What the heck is this stuff?" And 
So we have a bunch of bacteria here in the heavily diseased individuals that are uh, worker ileum bacteria. The Frischella, the Snodgrassella, and the Giliumella are all native to the adult worker where they participate in, in making that bee very healthy. Uh, here, so we have serratia as well, which is this red one, serratia marcescens, uh, which has been recently demonstrated to be a hive resident. Uh, we didn't know that until a couple years ago. Um, so we went and ran some paralytic viruses uh, for this guy because I went and looked at the pictures that were associated with, I don't have time to show you all the pictures that are associated with each of these uh, microbiomes, but the uh, the pictures associated with this one had had a lot of uh, varroa in them. So we suspected, well, there may be some paralytic viruses that are associated with this. This may be parasitic mite syndrome. Um, so we ran the paralytic viruses. We ran cashmere B virus, acute B paralysis virus, and deformed wing virus. And uh, it, this is the numbers here for uh, QB paralysis virus. So as kind of controls or comparisons, we, we ran the virus in the EF, a couple of the EFB yards as well, which are incredibly low. Uh, but certainly in the whole apiary, they were significantly elevated for both the asymptomatic larva and the symptomatic larva. And here are some of the pictures that are associated with the acute B paralysis virus in this uh, parasitic mite syndrome, putative parasitic mite syndrome. You can just dang, I see a varroa mite in dang near every picture. So that's generally a bad sign, <laughs> right? However, you see, I mean, this, this clearly has a lot of varroa. We didn't quantify the varroa because the, the apiary inspector doing this for us uh, didn't quantify the varroa for this particular yard. Uh, but presently, we're running a whole bunch that have the similar morphology, which is this melted, for those of you who know what brood disease looks like, these are some really melty, and they don't particularly look like uh, European fowl brood larva. We also found a strong relationship of serratia and snodgrassella. Um, so this was this was interesting, and the the different you know bacteria team up for different reasons. Snodgrassella has uh, sideraphores and 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 produces things that serratia can utilize, and vice versa. So sometimes these you know things work in teams, and generally in a gut environment, you have a lot of that going on, where the metabolic products of one bacteria are used by the other, and, and vice versa. So this really looks like uh, that's what's happening here, because there's a high amount of variation explained by uh, these two bacteria together. All right, so now on to the probiotics. So do probiotics work? So Randy Oliver wanted to do this, and I said, "Okay, let's do it," because he was doing all the uh, he was doing all the beekeeping, and I don't think you can buy better beekeeping. Uh, so I I said, "Fine." So we ran a we ran a study. Colonies were managed and treated by this guy right here. Randy Oliver, and we analyzed the gut microbiome and a number of disease markers um, to, to look at the effects of primarily probiotics. So these are the two that we looked at, and we looked at long-term probiotic application and recovery, so two different experiments um, using the same bees. So one, we applied antibiotics for eight months, and the other one was to see if, if these colonies can recover from antibiotic dysbiosis uh, with probiotic treatment. So Randy blinded me to the, as to the treatment, and he blinded himself. He's got a whole team out there where, so it was a blinded experiment. Uh, what are probiotics? Well, these are live microorganisms suggested to improve or supplement gut function. So they're expected to establish in the gut and then generally improve health. And so they're applied with sugar. And both of those products I showed you have the same probiotic species uh, advertised. So we tested these hypotheses. 
The feeding probiotic over time results in better colony performance. So it's measured by weight gain and cluster size. And this was Randy that did that work. And that either of the probiotics will establish in the gut. That's the work I did. The probiotic improves reestablishment of the core microbiome following treatments. And the feeding of probiotic affects virus yeast or nocebo prevalence or intensity. So let's look at the cluster sizes. So we had uh, no change in colony performance with probiotic application. So this was at apiary one. Um, there's no difference uh, between the probiotics and the controls in terms of colony performance as, as measured by uh, cluster size. And the same is true for apiary two. There was no difference um, for having a probiotic or not in there. So did the probiotic affect the gut microbiome? Um, again, I remind you that this is how uh, we look at the gut microbiome in terms of relative abundance. It's just a bar with 100%. Um, oh, you got a seizure warning here. The taxonomic membership is important as the even distribution of species is also very important for uh, characterizing uh, the gut microbiome. Again, dysbiosis is usually indicated by dominance of one or the other species like uh, H. pylori in your stomach uh, or Clostridium difficile will dominate your, your lower intestine. And that's a, those are very bad things. So we found uh, no effect on the gut microbiome following eight months of probiotic application. So here are our controls, and we have a very evenly distributed hindgut microbiome. All of the species that are typically there are there in the proportions uh, that typify a healthy worker microbiome. But there are no differences between the probiotics and the controls. So we also run a marker that tells us what's the absolute abundance of the of all of the bacteria in that system. And so it's a little more difficult to look at because this is the same data as that. But this one, you have these scale effects where you have to move the data up and down to be able to understand what's going on. Basically, there was no effect. And experiment two. We looked at the recovery from antibiotics. So here was the, the, the treatment and sampling schedule for, for that experiment. Um, we applied antibiotics, sampled for maximum effect of antibiotics. This all happened over winter, as you can see, and uh, then sample for one week recovery and a sample for three week recovery. So I was thinking by, hey, you know, three weeks, we should see the microbiomes getting better in these bees. So here are the controls, and I show you both the relative abundance on the bottom and the absolute abundance on the top. Um, so the controls uh, look quite good, like controls should look. You have one dysbiotic individual here was dominated by Gilliamella, which every now and then just decides to dominate a microbiome. Um, but generally, there's no change in these microbiomes over time, very little change. Here is oxytetracycline. So it, these are somewhat difficult to look at. I could show you all the individual tests, but that would take forever. So you just use your artist brain and you can look over here and see all these white things and how all those white things uh, seem to disappear. So that's bifidobacterium. And the one that hangs out with it and is actually metabolically involved with it is uh, Bombi lactobacillus. And you can see both of those things in the little little thing in between them is also a firm for um, another Bombi lactobacillus, but all of those disappear at the same kind of time. They disappear as a group, and then they're replaced uh, by Gilliamella, which often seems to replace things that have gone haywire. And then we have, uh, by day 19, we have a bunch of 
the queen bacteria. So this is a queen hindgut bacteria, and it sometimes pops up in foragers uh, that are older. Um, so it's associated with age in, in worker bees. But here it's uh, I'm popping up quite readily. And these are confirming results that were already known uh, by Raymond and some other individuals who looked at the effect of antibiotics uh, on the honeybee gut microbiome. And so we've confirmed a lot of things, but what this adds to that is this is 33 days after the beginning of antibiotic treatment. And I was, I was thinking that, hey, that should be recovered to some degree, you know, by 33 degrees, but virtually none of the bacteria look like they're recovering that well. We have something, some things that could be construed as, as recovery, um, but the evenness, which was something I talked about earlier, is still significantly different from the, from the beginning microbiomes. And that's true for both of the tested antibiotics. So here's the other antibiotic that we ran, uh, tylosin, and it, it, it's very different dynamics in terms of how it, uh, how it set out. So it, first off, it, it destroyed a lot more in terms of size at day 10, and then the size started coming back, but when they recovered from the initial size depletion, um, they really have the alpha 2.1 starting earlier and also Gilliamella replacing again this these white things that are bifidobacterium and bombylactobacillus uh, moving this way. So they had generally very similar effects. And the, the thing about a lot of these microbes is they have their gram negative and they have antibiotic resistance genes. And this was demonstrated by uh, Tian, I think in 2012, he's another person out of the Moran lab who did some really, some really good work on antibiotic resistance in honeybees. And so that's what we have. We have a bunch of, so the Gilliamella have, definitely have a lot of antibiotic resistance genes as do the 2.1, the Bartonella. Um, so this basically, anyway, I don't want to get too into what happened with the antibiotics because that's what the story became. The point is that there was no effect at all of the probiotic that we could find whatsoever. So, uh, no effect of the probiotic on disease state. And I'm not going to show you all this data either because it's horrible to look at and even worse to hear about. Uh, but we ran a quantitative PCR for fungi, which is getting mostly yeast and a lot of these sugar tolerant yeasts that are part of the social microbiome as well. Um, we don't know which of those are good or bad, but these... Uh, uh, just fungi in general wasn't differed. Nosema didn't differ. EFB markers uh, didn't differ. And then we ran these four viruses, uh, both deformed wing virus A and B, and neither of these differed by uh, probiotic. No. They, and they differed by antibiotic, though. So the antibiotic uh, resulted in, you know, some, some of these becoming more prevalent within the hive. So conclusion for that is that the probiotic application had no effect on the gut microbiome or on colony size with long-term application or following antibiotic-induced dysbiosis. So the the you know the the depth of the study was overwhelming. So <laughs> uh, I'm pretty confident in the results. So with the high throughput methodology, we had 14 million total DNA sequences and 11,700 unique sequences. And then we do this thing uh, um, where we determine whether or not we've fully uh, saturated our sampling. Um, and we definitely did. We sampled this to exhaustion. Uh, five of the seven introduced probiotic bacterial species were not detected at all. They didn't exist in the data set in any of these 14 million reads. So I liken that to throwing a, a rabbit into a combine. So bifidobacterium bifidum, and this one we found in two to 4% of samples, but they had negligible abundance and they weren't associated with probiotic application. So I don't think either of those probiotics do anything. So we're now, this is the coolest uh, thing that we're testing as far as I'm concerned. So we found earlier on, we, we ran a number of studies 
Um, this was the first study where we started thinking about it. And so the queen, here's what happened as, as you transition from a nurse to a queen, what happens to your gut microbiome? And here's what happens to the host metrics. So nutrition goes down as you transition, batelogenin goes down, immunity goes down, insulin signaling and antioxidant levels go up. And this is what happens concurrently in the gut microbiome here. So we lost lactobacillus 5, berm 4, and bifido go down. And acetobacteria, I see, like I told you, that was the one we were looking at, increases and the other protobacteria increase. Now in the queen, the queen becomes, and this is only up to 18 months of age. So we got queens that were six months, I think, you know, four months, six months, 16 months, 18 months. And then a lot of the earlier queen development. So we're we're redoing and filling in a lot of that stuff. But the queens generally, they lose this alpha 2.1, this acetobacteria. So they lose it very rapidly in, in early life. So it's super abundant in newly mated queens. And then it just it cascades downhill in abundance uh, up to about 18 months where it's virtually gone uh, from the queen's uh, microbiome entirely. And I don't know if I wanna advertise this hypothesis on the on your recorded thing. I was gonna steal it from me. Oh, well, I'm sorry, but this is, this is a good one. So we also found from a different study, uh, here, I just told you this, that the queens lose this alpha 2.1 and transition to worker-like gut microbiomes by 16 to 18 months. And from another study that we did on some of these, uh, the Ashurst bees over in uh, the Imperial Valley, uh, they also suffer from incredible temperatures over there. But these uh, first-year queens outperform second-year queens according to brood counts and validating what you know, Brian Ashurst has been repeating. I mean, he's been uh, requeening uh, consistently. I mean, every year he just buys new queens and puts them in because he's getting better performance out of the first year queens and the second year queens. And apparently, I guess that's cost effective for him. I don't know. I haven't done the, I haven't done that kind of analysis, but that was pretty interesting. So we know those two things. And we also know that the alpha 2.1 genome, so we've sequenced a couple of their genomes here. Um, and they're equipped with genes for nitrogen recycling. So they, they transition nitrate to nitrite and, and nitrogen detoxification. So nitrogen species are a lot like oxygen species where they can be really toxic if they're not dealt with. So it has the genes to detoxify uh, nitrogen species as well. And those are nitrogen reactive species, just like oxygen reactive species. Um, so this suggests an association with the host nitrogen metabolism in younger, more productive queens. So uh, we've got some experiments set up where, where we're examining uh, the relationship of post metabolism to uh, to the abundance of, of alpha 2.1. And so we're doing some stuff both in the lab and and, uh, and with the queens are hard to work with. The last queen thing we tried didn't work so well, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do something with this. Oh, this is other stuff. Oh, well, here's our... So in terms of defining our social microbiome and pathosphere, so we took a bunch of isolates from our 2021 EFB outbreak. So these are things that capitalize on uh, stressed and colonies that can't really defend themselves, I suppose. And uh, so we're getting a whole bunch of them and running them to see if they can survive in royal jelly and honey, because this is essentially our test, right? And we should, we're trying to add propolis to this list um, to test for the social microbiome. And then we're gonna test all of these pathosphere bacteria to see if, because like serratia, the one I showed you earlier, is certainly just a pathogen. That's what it does. It's not part of the, the happy-go-lucky microbiome. Um, and to, and to see how these things, so Gilliamella, which is the one that was popping up during the antibiotic 
treatment in both the antibiotics treatments and replacing stuff. So it does pretty well in honey, but the royal jelly is the thing that seems to thwart the gilliamella. And we don't find gilliamella hardly at all in queens. So that's true of Frischella too. So Frischella is the new, this guy right here, it's the new bacteria on the block evolutionarily. So it's only been part of the microbiome for probably the shortest, for the shortest amount of time of any of the other microbiome members, but evolutionarily quite, quite some amount of time. But um, it too is being thwarted by royal jelly. So they all do really well in honey. And uh, I mean, if you remember early publications on it, nothing could live in honey. Well, these, these things are living pretty good in honey. Um, and I'll, on this serratia species. So this one, which is the one we found in the larva, is, uh, does quite well in a lot of it. So we're refining a lot of these methods to figure out really what are the niche uh, requirements and what are some of the in-hive environmental uh, variables that these things can withstand. Um, oh, this was from an early study where we fed, where we fed the Snagrasola or we fed bees aged bee bread, which gave them dysbiosis. And uh, they ended up with a lot more fraschella. It goes back to this, this over here. Um, and so fraschella is always in there, but it is not one of the, it's not one of the nice bacteria. It doesn't make little teams with other bacteria to, to eat away at pollen or anything. It's, although it, it does eat away at pollen quite readily, it's not a team player. It's, uh, it forms this scab in the pylorus, which is where the Malpighian tubules empty, you know, from the, from the hemolymph. And so the waste flows down into the, you know, ilium. So a lot of the, a lot of the microbiome, if they're living uh, right there, and it, it forms a scab, which you can see down here under microscopy. Um, it just basically destroys the, the basal membrane of that thing. And it, it, and it ends up with a, an immune cascade that is very expensive for the bee. Here's that Perar associated with the thorax weight in our study. So, and associated with horse mortality. So the more Epirara you have, the more likely you're gonna die. And the more Epirara you have, the lower weight your thorax is gonna be. And this just goes on and on, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about that. We could just have some questions if people have questions. I have a question. I All heard right some years back that gut microbes can influence human thought and behavior. Yes. Um, can these <laughs> uh, microbes and bees do the same thing with them? <laughs> yes. Yep. So Hal Zhang has produced uh, some of the, and, and, and well, to, Laurent Keller got together with uh, uh, Philip Engel over in Luzon, and they've done uh, some very interesting stuff about uh, exactly that. Um, so they they looked at all the brain metabolites, and they yes, the the gut microbiota influences cognition, uh, probably in lots of different organisms. We know that's true in humans, right? It's associated with dementia and the onset of a lot of things, and. And it's, it's certainly happening in honeybees too. So if you don't got the right microbiome, they can't do these complex social behaviors. Yeah. That goes sure. along with things like reports of uh, behavior being influenced by exposure to pesticides, um, herbicides. Yeah, sure that happens too. Mm. Well, yeah. Maybe the That's effect, it, it may be an indirect effect on their microbiome. Huh. Well, there's a set of, well, some of them are work directly on acetylcholine receptors, right? Which would be a pretty direct effect, I guess. Mm. On the bee, that wouldn't be an indirect effect through the microbiome. But some of the things may be indirect through the microbiome. Well, when we treat our bees for uh, uh, varroa with formic acid, we're acidifying the uh, hive. 
uh, to a huge extent, slamming it. And I wonder how that affects the microbiome. Um, I guess you're more concentrated on the, the microbiome in the bee as opposed to the microbiome that exists on the frames and uh, on, on the comb. Quite the opposite. Yeah, do you want to do that study? <laughs> um, you, so you don't have an answer to how that... Um, um, yes, let's do that study. I'll do that study with you. As soon as I can put together a, a huge... Uh, I'll help out. Uh, war chest a, of, of, of money for that. Um, we ran some oxalic acid. So Randy did an oxalic acid dribble on some of these. And I don't even know which ones they were. So I have to have a meeting with them and find out which of these did you dribble with oxalic or did you do all of them? But I think that's his favorite mode of application now. I don't know. Well, the commercial product are the formic acid strips uh, that people routinely use to knock down mite populations. Um, um, especially when there is brood in the hive. Uh, the mm -hmm. oxalic acid treatments uh, tend to be good for uh, cases where there's no brood in the hive or uh, where people are treating uh, long-term low level with the uh, pads uh, with oxalic acid and glycerin. So that's okay. typically on. Yeah, Randy only, Randy only uses dribble in the, in the early December and then everything oh. else. He's, he really heavily favors the oxalic glycerin on uh, whatever substrate. Okay. The Swedish dish child sponges is the, the more current, although he's looking for a better substrate or cheaper substrate. All right. And I, I, would, I would concur it works really well. Well, I don't think I'd get in trouble for investigating that. So I'd be happy to see what, what happens there. And especially uh, with the social microbiome, because the propolis, if, if, were you here for that? That was all about the social microbiome. Well, Randy has uh, colonies that are his mite-resistant ones, which I suspect are not being treated with the um, oxalic acid strips. Right. And um, the, But if your test B populations were in the general population, they probably would be treated with something like that. And I wonder if that affects the results. That's a question. Well, in general, in general, oxalic doesn't doesn't track through the hive very much. So, dear, I think I think you're 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 thinking that uh, like formic is and oxalic are being chemical overlords, and, and I think the the dynamics are much different where they don't really invade the hive in general. Randy adds a lot of uh, different variables as well uh, when he does his. Uh, output for his experiments for data output, uh, which is also something that needs to be considered with any type of treatment. It's not just oh, oxalic and the uh, glycerin. Yeah. Do you have a for instance on that? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to go to his uh, website and see. But he, yeah, he totally <clears throat> broke down uh, the different types of uh, methodologies that he uses for his um, his data, which is why I like to, to read everything he does. Yeah, he does some great stuff. No question. Yeah, he, he experiments. That's what I like. He really he really goes out there and says, well, maybe this deployment method isn't isn't, isn't like the best efficacy for this particular treatment so let me roll something let me try this let me try that which yeah. is why the, the little uh the cellulose sponges since he switched to the cellulose sponges uh uh from the shop towels uh i've just had to treat once <laughs> you nice. know and in, in the summer and I, I go in there and i i look and i see and it's like wow you know there, there's still sponge there and i'm still not getting a lot of mite drops so this is really a good method, a good uh, deployment method. Right. Well, do you see some bad things happening with the formic acid uh, treatments? Um, There's know, queen loss. That's one of the big ones. There's queen loss. The queen. Yeah, you just have to gauge the, you know, everything is climate dependent, obviously. Everything is mm. 
based on the the um, uh, strength, the hive strength. Mm. Well, the queen has uh, she shares uh, microbes with the the social. So the two major bacteria that are found in the social microbiome, the apolactobacillus and the mm -hmm. bacilla, are native to the queen gut. And mm -hmm. how do how do they get there, right? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to look at your uh, slide deck. Which one? Just the whole thing. <laughs> like, uh, I just want to look at your data. I'm a numbers driven. Person. I want to look at your data. Well, see your data. Isn't I'm that sexy? Right. I want to see your data. Well, that real data is not on here. Uh, I know, I know, stuff. but you know, you print it out. Oh, here's a here's some here's, that's the almost one data. Focusing so on here's the the bombella. And here it is in the queen, it's in the mouth parts. How do I enlarge this? They're shared. So the mouth parts of the workers and the queens share this Bombella apis, but queens have a unique and unknown that we're trying to figure out what it is, Bombella species that's in its midgut and its ilium. <laughs> and this is starting to get into the real important parts of the workings of the queens. Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, the commensal back to the alpha 2.1 that I was talking a lot about. But here's the social microbiome, or these two right here, and a few other stragglers, right? So, yeah, the outliers are there. Yeah, they're yeah. shared right here. And that's why I call it the social, the social microbiome. Yeah. It's also in all of these other things, right? And so be exact has let us uh, figure out that, hey, these, these are the same species, you know, but how, how species are there? How many different strains are there that have different functions? Those are, this is all still yeah. to be uh, uncovered. So I'm interested in, in the, you know, I, I tried my best to do the, the beekeeper stuff, but I'm really interested in just the natural function of things. <clears throat> and now that I'm old, I can just admit that. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> well, Randy was asking what you haven't done for uh, commercial beekeepers, and I suppose one of the questions is whether acaricides uh, affect the flora in the uh, the bees themselves. Um, that would be probably <clears throat> Amitraz, which is the only one that's really still very effective, or yeah. Mofos and Fubalinate, which are not very effective. They're anymore. not working anymore. Yeah. Well, I've moved now into looking at the, the, the viruses that are associated with Varroa, so I, uh, I would probably end up tainting myself with everything about Varroa soon. Mm. Yeah. It's just become an integral part of the hive, so they've, they've sequenced what's in Varroa, which I find very interesting, what it's, trans, you know, what it's transmitting uh, to other organisms. <clears throat> So it has the serratia. The serratia that I mentioned uh, is in the varroa. Yeah. It's a nasty bacteria. You also mentioned that uh, pollen uh, sort of, I, I impl uh, inferred that pollen sort of evolves after the bees have uh, stored it, uh, or the bee bread sort of evolves with age. No, that's the, that's the, uh, the great myth. Oh, yeah. Well, in in our the great area, myth was that uh, are most interested in in the new pollen, and they the they seldom uh, go after the uh, pollen that's stored in the frames, and it sort of accumulates in a lot of our hives and uh, I think yeah. take a lot of it out, just because it's occupying space they need. Here was the great myth. Is that backwards? Yeah, this was in the American Bee Journal, I think, back in 2000 and something, where the, there was a, <clears throat> the necessary the necessary microbes that are in in bee pollen to turn it into this nutritionally complete thing, which turned out not to be happening at all. Uh, so they prefer two day old. So there's a burst, a bloom of these two bacteria and some sugar tolerant yeasts. So we're trying to get a handle on these sugar tolerant yeasts. So there's Starmorella and uh, some others. And I don't know how consistently those occur because I haven't really done much 
uh, on that yet. So, but there are definitely some sugar tolerant yeasts that are contributing to this big spike in uh, microbial abundance right here. And that's when they really go after it. And that's been uh, demonstrated a couple of different times now using the same method that I designed of putting a cellulose acetate over, it was very simple, you just put cellulose acetate over the bee bread and then keep track of when it appears and disappears. Um, I think Sue has a question. Okay. Hey, thanks for your talk. Um, so my question was about fungus. Um, and I don't know how much you, I don't know how much you studied fungus um, and bees. Um, A little and bit. The benefits, and the benefits. Um, we had a gentleman from the Fungi Perfecti guys come to the club and talk a little bit about researching bees. And if I recall right, um, he was looking at raishi <coughs> um, conception um, and cordyceps. And I was um, wondering if the consumption of cordyceps might um, handle some of the sugar in their gut. Um, but anyway, I, yeah, I was just, because um, there are times when I'll put that in my bee bread. I mean, I'm feeding it to my dog. I'm feeding it to myself. <laughs> so. You talking about yeast? No, uh, raishi mushroom powder and cordyceps oh. mushroom powder and putting it in the bee bread. Oh. That, I mean, are the uh, pollen patties I make? I uh, don't know, but it sounds interesting. Uh, what fungus is it? Rice. Right. It, am I, I might be pronouncing it wrong. Right. Raishi mushroom. Oh, okay. And, um, and the cordyceps. Those right. were the it's... two at the time that that group in Washington were right. looking into the benefits because yeah. they see bees picking it up. And sure. so oh, yeah, yeah. they were yeah. looking at it um, as to why they think the bees need it and what it might benefit. Yeah. And so I, you know, homeopathically try to give that to the bees um now um raising the bees my winter bees although we don't have a winter here but um. right but you have a period that's particularly nasty where they don't get any forage right december and seem to die off really good that's what happens here too we don't really have a winter but boy they they sure like to die off uh during that period no, I wouldn't. Paul Stamets would be the guy. And then, uh, so Vincent, I had a postdoc here that uh, was really interested in. He's working on an algae, uh, an algae-based food um, for bees, um, microalgae. So he's he's much more knowledgeable. We have some fungus that we've run from the hive, and I am still wading through that data. I mean, massive next generation sequencing of, of all these fungal <laughs> You yeah, must determine to grow stronger. What? There isn't any shame in being weak. I think that's somebody's TV. Mimi? Is shame your TV is on? <laughs> yeah, you could send me that stuff and I'll hook you up with people who would know how to answer your question better than I would. Greg, you have a question. Yeah, I do. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned that there were some microbes that live actually live in the honey. Um, and uh, yep. So I guess the question I have is, you know, a lot of times when we process honey, we would heat it up to like maybe decrystallize it and things like that. Um, is that going to kill all those microbes at that time? And so I'm wondering if that's if there's some less health benefit to your honey that's been heated versus honey that's not heated, you know, what kind of temperature do these microbes handle? Oh, heated, okay. Uh, ooh, um, I don't 
the the microbes that I'm talking about, I don't think need to be worried about. You, you need to worry about the spore forming uh, microbes that, right? That's what they generally, and food uh, security, that's what they worry about. I'm not worried about, you know, not, not being toxic. I'm just thinking about some people believe there's health benefits to honey, eating honey. And I'm, you know, I thought maybe having the microbes in raw honey. Is, would be better for better for you than maybe having them killed by heat. Uh, you know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know about honey. that either. That's a probiotic question too. So most of the probiotics that are fed to humans don't work either. Just like we demonstrated for these probiotics being fed to the, because you're putting microbes into a system that, that they're not evolved to be in. Okay, so you don't think there's any health benefits of the probiotics? The probiotic that, that we just tested, uh, the two probiotics, I don't think there's any benefit to those based on the based on the parameters that we measured. No. Yeah, I think that's contrary if my, to what I recall. Uh, uh, Dr. Elena from UC Davis said, I think she said that the probiotics showed like an increase in in the size of her, uh, the cluster by two frames. Is she talking about the same probiotics? I believe that's true. I, 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 I'm not, you know, I have, there was so much going on that night, I don't recall exactly, but I, I think it was, it was pretty significant that she saw an increase in yeah. cluster size. Well, it, you know, uh, we didn't find any of the probiotics at all in our entire data set. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I asked her which probiotics she was using, and I guess she would, there were some commercially available ones she was using. Well, if you're putting, there's going to be a big difference if you're putting a tailor-made probiotic that that is that contains the honeybee gut bacteria. Uh, that might be a different thing. So, but the the Swiss, the uh, that was one of the first things that I worked with. Was this? Uh, So they found the 13 bacteria that uh, this is what it was. And they were making this over there in Sweden. And I went over and hung out with them for a while. And uh, so it's the, those are the honeybee, the core honeybee bacteria that are in there. That's the core gut bacteria. So those would stand the best chance, but generally they're already in there. So what is probably better is to have a prebiotic that will allow, you know, or to generate conditions that would allow the bacteria that are already in there to, uh, to do their job and to be where they're supposed to be. I would, I would guess. I, I, so, I could, so, so, so could I jump in? Um, um, what are your thoughts about um, feeding bees, pollen patties? Um, Versus, I mean, what is, is what is your thoughts about the quality of um, pollen, perhaps in certain areas because of global warming and the lower CO two levels, um, lowering the nutritional value of lots of foods grown? Um, do you think it's beneficial uh, to feed bees uh, some bit? Um, to uh, feed those gut microbes and keep them healthy. And if I might interject, next month I think we're having Gordon Wardell, who is uh, probably more tuned into uh, the uh, protein supplement products. Right, but in I terms think it of, probably is, yeah. But in, but in terms of um, your research on keeping the gut healthy. Uh, so we we did some uh, we fed some probiotic or not probiotic some patties and then looked uh, at bees that we fed so we had twenty five percent pollen though in that food and seventy five percent patty I'm not going to mention what patty uh, but 
It did it did pretty good. It didn't disrupt the microbiome that much, and the bees uh, developed quite well on it. And I think there's a number of uh, there's a number of substitute diets that the bees develop quite well on that don't really interfere with their microbiomes. So, and Gordy certainly knows a lot more about uh, you know he developed Mega Bee here uh, in Tucson, and he certainly knows a lot more about that than I do. Sounds like you're saying that the microbiome is pretty tolerant. It's tolerant of a lot of things. It really is. It's quite robust to a number of things. Uh, if you're messing it up, you've really, you've really done something. Antibiotics uh, you know, certainly mess it up. Uh, but apparently, it was tolerant to the, you know, the food we fed them, and yeah. Well, it seems like with, with people you have, um, our stomach is pretty good at destroying the things that would otherwise um, make us sick. And it sounds like the foregut of the bee is also very effective at uh, killing off the pathogenic bacteria. Yeah, the social microbiota, I think it goes well beyond the foregut. The foregut just gives us something to think about. Hey, look, this is a social stomach. Uh, the social stomach is out in the hive. And when they, when they leave, when they go off in a swarm and they form a new colony, it is not random environmental microbes that are populating the hive. The hive is being repopulated by the microbes they've carried with them. So that would mean that if you would treat a hive with antibiotics and then it were to swarm, then that's a colony that would be established would have a microbiome very different than any of the other colonies. That would be a very interesting experiment. Yeah. That's Another one to add to the list. Interesting one. Yeah. So that's one of the things we're trying to figure out are, are where's the border between the things that actually go with the swarm and, and things that uh, come from the environment. And that is figured that out for both the social microbiome and the pathosphere. Because there's certainly a lot of EFB that is just consistently in all sorts of colonies everywhere, right? But then you never see, and it's the 16S sequence, and then you can culture something that you know that that will be categorized as Melissococcus, uh, but you don't see any outbreak of EFB in that hive, you know, for years. So it may have been that this, you know, who knows how. And so the, how do pathogens evolve, right? Do they evolve from things that used to be friendly or, you know, they don't really have an agenda, right? They're just like they'll eat anything that's dead that's they can get away with eating, you know? Yeah, I, I have a sense that like swarms tend to be Pretty darn healthy, and they seem to grow much quicker than, let's say, your ongoing hives. And at least that's been my, you know, very simple observation. So maybe you know, it's possible that maybe just the subset of micro bio uh, microbes they take with them is is missing the one that's slowing them down in the bigger hive. I don't know. It just it just seems kind of odd that swarms are seem to be much um, quicker to build. Yeah. Sure. Well, the shook swarm, I think you're talking about is the shook swarm effect, right? Where you can get rid of uh, EFB and, and some of these things. Yeah. Well, it builds up in numbers, right? So right. It'll build up in numbers and it'll build up in numbers in the, uh, in the food. And, in, and the pollen is one way that the gut bacteria itself is re, uh, reestablished. Right, so the the foragers constantly, you know, endless movements of the foragers putting, you know, pollen off the back of its abdomen and into there. So there's there's a lot of bee bread is filled with the gut bacteria, not you know, filled with it, but there are traces of gut bacteria in every bee bread cell. All of the bacteria that establish in the gut are in the bee bread cells. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah. But they're, they're dominated by these bomb, this bombella and the api lactobacillus. 
but still the the all of the gut bacteria, the constitutive gut bacteria are all in there. So maybe uh, I'm just thinking it's possible that a swarm, the fact that it's taking only a subset of these microbes with them, and it's like kind of a reset for the bees you know, from their current environment. It kind of gives them yeah. a reset to a different starting point. Yeah. And so maybe uh, us trying to prevent bees from swarming might be a bad thing. Maybe we should let them swarm. Can they help? Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. If you get swarms, you get new queens. Uh, possibly, uh, maybe you're right. Maybe so. Maybe that's where the growth's coming from, just because it's a new queen. Uh, yeah. yeah, the queen is a really interesting part of that puzzle, you know. And where, you know, where does the queen get her microbiome, right? If she doesn't contact the, she doesn't contact the other queen, right? Mm. That's true. Yeah, well, I mean, indirectly, because she gets fed by the other bees that feed the other queen, so. She right, does. she gets it from the social microbiota. Right. Yeah. So I think I'm onto something with the social microbiota. <laughs> okay. Yes, this has been really informative. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys. You guys got quite a group. Well, Shaw mentioned in, in one of his programs for us that um, he likes the earlier mated queens in uh, in Anglesey uh, because they are not uh, already infected with, uh, I think it was Nosema. And the, the queens that were mated later in the season often were um, uh, infected with Nosema. So he preferred the earlier ones. Huh. Um, so he characterized it as a, a sexually transmitted disease. Mm. And, and, and essentially infecting the offspring. Yeah. Well, the that no semen would totally happen in the wintertime. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving up your evening for us. Uh, it's been very entertaining for us. I hope it's been fun for you too. Oh, good. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Invite me back. <laughs>